there and welcome everybody to a dog training summit panel. Uh, many, many months ago, uh, Isaac and Mitch asked Kelly and I if we could help them select speakers for a summit. And so now here it is. And this is the, in Isaac and Mitch's words, the pre kickoff launch party, which I mean, it, you can't <laughs> kick off, it can't be pre. And if it's pre, it's not the launch party. It's kind of like pre-boarding on a plane. But here we are. So we have uh, 23 <laughs> presentations ranging from puppy training, family dog training, adolescent dog training, reactivity, training for the real world, fun and games, uh, showcasing a wide variety of training techniques. We have 16 speakers, uh, some doubling up to give uh, two presentations. Um, all of these people um, are people that Kelly and I sincerely respect. They are as entertaining as they are informative, and you'll see lots of real-time video on how they train. You're absolutely going to love this summit. And so, without further delay, my panelists all thinking, come on in, get on with it. Without further delay, let me introduce my illustrious panel, and then uh, we'll let them talk, and I shall try to be quiet. I see Kelly going woohoo at that point. Well, that's true. So, oh, yeah, quiet. We'll see how long that lasts. Julie Case, <laughs> wave, Julie. Julie Hi. Case is Hi. the owner, <laughs> the owner and founder of Ultimate Canine. She's a certified law enforcement instructor and master trainer with 27 years' experience training dogs for families, police departments therapy service work, as well as for special forces. Julie specializes in the development and training of socially and environmentally stable puppies for working in schools, developmental centers for children, police departments, and the military. Kelly Dunbar is the training wave, Kelly. Kelly, wave, yes. Kelly Dunbar is the training director for serious puppy and dog training the originator of off-leash puppy classes and reward-based dog training, a founding principal of Dunbar Academy, an online educational resource for dog professionals and donors, and creator of Open for a non-profit educational resource that provides education and training for shelter workers, volunteers, and animal shelters. She writes regularly, and very well, I should say, for several publications and has lectured around the world. Kelly has four Belgian Shepherds, <laughs> both Malinois and Working Turfs, who she competes with in French spring sport, plus two tiny terriers that provide comic relief and many humbling moments daily. Um, I, there was a typo there. I think you said two tiny terrors. I'm, uh, I'm, either way, but I'm oh my sure goodness. you meant terriers. I left, I left Hundi out, the Rottweiler. Amanda Gagnon, wave Amanda. Amanda Gagnon is an anthrozoologist, dog trainer, and dog behavior consultant. She is the founder and training director of Amanda Gagnon Dog Training, where she teaches group classes, private training sessions, online courses, and apprenticeship programs. Amanda has a master's degree in anthrozoology, is certified by the International Association of Animal Behavior Consultants, and is a professional member of the Association of Professional Dog Trainers. She is co-founder of Gentle Beast, where she develops dog training products, apps, toys, and equipment, and has developed training programs for volunteers to support shelter dogs at New York City's animal care centers. Also, she co-founded Muddy Pords Rescue and the Riverside Dog Owner Group. Amanda's been featured on Good Morning America, Inside Edition, Fox and Friends, Good Day, Philadelphia Dogster, Manhattan Sideways, Sirius Radio and Future TV. I'm sure that was a lot of very early mornings getting out of bed. Yeah. Go Rosie <laughs> Happenden. Joe Rosie, can you wave? Joe Rosie is one third of the School of Canine Science an online school that teaches more than 20,000 dog trainers internationally. She has a degree in applied psychology and a postgrad in animal behavior, but her passion is hands-on dog training out in the field. Joe Rosie is an accredited expert witness in court in the UK. She built and ran her own training school in Sussex 
and has lectured around the globe from New Zealand to Alabama, from Paris to California. <laughs> I'm sorry, it makes me laugh. From New Zealand to Alabama. <laughs> Woo! Uh, she has written three books and presented three primetime TV shows about dog training. Jo Rosie now resides in sunny southern Spain with her dog training fiance Nando, four working Malinois, a Bichla, a Springer Spaniel, and a little bully puppy, as well as her four year old son Santino. When not working at the School of Canine Science, you can find her training Mondio Ring or riding horses in the mountains. Um, I, I edit these, obviously. It actually said training Mondio Ring and riding horses in the mountains. I thought, wow, Mondio's gone horseback. You know, this is exciting. Why not? All Why right. not? Let's Mondo. get to it. This is when I shall try to be quiet. Um, please um, feel free to interact with each other. Um, I have just two questions. Um, question one, um, how would you define dog training? I mean, what's it all about? And obviously this definition is from your point of view. So anyone jump in at any time, please interrupt, interact, and off you go. So what's it all about? I guess for me, dog training is about providing an appropriate education for uh for the animal to live in the environment by which they are going to live. So uh, an appropriate education might be for a police dog or for a sports dog or for a family pet, very different. That's, that's very well thought out. I like that. I like the words education and I like education with the expectation of what they have to do. Any comments, anyone? I, I like that a lot too. I, I, I think the same, especially like that you mentioned context because when you say dog trainer to every different person, they have a different concept. Some people picture circus dog tricks. Some people picture canine sports. Some people picture police dog training. And it, those are very, very different. So someone comes to you and says, hey, could you train my dog? The first thing you have to find out is what the heck they mean by that. So I, I love that. I love the context specific answer. And I think for me, it's also, I, I want to pull the humans into the equation a lot. So it's educating the human and the dog about what they're both going to need to have a good relationship together in whatever context that is. Yes, I think that that's a, that's a great point, Amanda, because everyone thinks, you know, um, everyone, so many people, they come for, for companion dog training specifically, um, in particular, and maybe in other venues as well. Um, they say they want you to train the dog. Right, mm -hmm. you know, here, here, you know, dog training is 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 magic, and if you you put your hands on the dog, and and they'll behave. Whereas it is obviously, um, you know, it's an interspecies um, <laughs> interaction, and to me, it's also it's a language, right? It's teaching them a common language and giving the humans and the dogs um, some way to communicate clearly to, with each other, and I do think with each other because we want to teach dogs how to understand people's wishes and we need to teach people how to read dogs and their intention behaviors and their emotions, hopefully their body language so that um, we can take two, you know, two different languages and hopefully dog training is a third language where they can, they can meet. I have to agree with Kelly. I, uh, um, I always say dog training is not magic and uh, they already know <laughs> how to sit. They already know how to, track a deer they already know how to catch a mouse and how to lay down we have to teach them exactly the human language whether it's russian or dutch or english whatever that language is it's just thousands of repetitions patience i call it uh, the formula of three eyes imprint improve impress that's dog training to me that's nice i like, I that. like that i like i love the eyes <laughs> <laughs> well, you have you have a formula I use all the time, Ian. Uh, the 3D uh, subtraction <laughs> duration. So mine is imprint, improve, impress. <laughs> oh, oh, I, I didn't. Uh, you have the three Ds. Ds weren't my idea. That uh, just one of the many things you know you read or hear, and then it becomes yours. But you know, but, but you have the three Ds, us. Ian. Pardon? Don't you? If you have the three Es. Efficient. Yeah. Efficacy, easy, efficient, effective, and enjoyable. I mean, yeah. I have <laughs> four effective, enjoyable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
But when, when, when I, I, I talk, I, I usually take the enjoyable, the reward-based, the positive nature for granted. I always talk about, is it easy? Is it quick? Is it effective? Yeah. Thank you for my four E's. Let's no, but I think, I think the, if the, if, uh, the quick, which, you know, the efficient, I suppose, in that is, um, is really important, especially when you, well, it, when you're dealing with um, companion dogs. Because, you know, as, as trainers, we, we're nerds, right? We love behavior. We love observing dogs. All, we can watch all day, you know, and, and two dogs interacting or one dog just sniffing about. And we really care about the why and the how. And, and you know, as much as people may love their, their family companion, uh, we have to remember as, as companion dog trainers that most people don't have the time or interest level that we do. So... Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's there's usually, almost always, uh, I think more than one way, one pathway to get to an end result. Um, but I think one of the things that pet dog trainers and owners need to um, consider is you maybe you don't need the fastest way, you know, the, the fastest way you need, you know, you need, there's so many factors, which I think we should talk about um, to consider when you create a plan. But um you do need to make it not a two year long process if possible or a six month process. Most people don't have the time, energy or patience or interest to um, to go with the long road. So that's kind of an interesting, I don't know. I often um, think maybe. it's a bit like a bit like when I take my car to the garage. But I, <laughs> that I think some people, when they bring their dog to a dog trainer, it's kind of similar. They're like, but I, need, I, I do need to do my lessons. I need to learn how to drive. I need to learn the basics of how to change the oil or change a tire. But I don't want to know about the, Combibulator that's in that engine and why it when it's split how it's yeah, sure. split and how to fix it like <laughs> I, like can you fix it give it back to me and then tell me how to drive it and I think some people are like that and I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with that and I think as, a, as an industry of dog trainers we need to make sure that we are catering towards that type of person as well where they don't really want to understand about you know Skinner and Pavlov and, and all the background of everything and actually they just want to know how to drive their car effectively every day and they want us to, to try and put in those those prevention techniques to ensure that things don't go wrong again in the future. I think that's a very important point because we actually all like that with things that lay outside of our passion and I, I find that a lot of dog trainers are a little sort of high horse the way they will talk down to an owner like then you shouldn't have got a dog if you don't want to spend 24 seven training it, you know, like I do. Um, and yeah, it, they love their dog. They've got a dog and they want it to work for them with the constraints that they have. So it's, it's a very important point because, you know, you drop off your car. The, the one question you ask is when can I pick it up? <laughs> When's it going to be fixed? And so that's how a lot of dog owners feel about their dog. And that's our job. I'm sorry. You don't say, well, we got a three month program for you or the, where dog training has come from uh, for 70 years, which was repetitive obedience drills on leash. And people were in class for three years every week. I, mean, I couldn't, you know, I, that's where, how I started. Well, Amazing. Those were nerds, though. Those were yeah. early nerds, prototypical dog nerds. No, no, they, they were forced to, you see. Or I mean, they were English. <laughs> no, no. They, they were dog owners and that was the only thing available to them the only training offered were akc or kc obedience classes and they went on forever it was more like a social club you know yeah that's where the english part comes in i think in england there's another culture where people no but in england people like dog training is a recreational hobby for a lot of people there's a lot of clubs and stuff Okay, yeah, I, I just want to comment on this English bashing thing. No, the English <laughs> part is, I, I'll tell you, when I went and gave my first puppy training workshop in England, I was talking about puppy classes, and someone said, you charge for your classes? That's the English thing. They were all yeah. free. You know? <laughs> yeah, we actually professionalized it over stateside here. So sorry, I, I got to shut up. Yeah. Okay, I need I need to shut up too, but I have one more. Well, only one more thing to say. Uh, so, I, Joe, Joe, I've never really thought of it about um, being like an auto mechanic kind of situation, and I and I definitely see where it is. Uh, but there's also you know there is a human side to it, right? So there, it is relational. I, I've always thought of it more as like couples therapy. Mm -hmm. That you know, 
Um, I think it depends on when I think it depends on whether you're talking about like behavior cases and problems where there's a relationship breakdown when when there's specific problems for example if breed specific needs aren't being met or you need to kind of reevaluate who the two people are in the couple and reintroduce them and say actually you know this is your dog and this is what they like and I think you think your dog's like this but actually they're like that or or vice versa you think your owner's like this but actually they're like that um I think that's that's one that's one yeah. thing but I think that when it comes to your average Joe and your regular pet owners who have who have kind of done a little bit of research or, or found a dog they like and they've got an average Joe dog in an average Joe situation I do think that I do think it's very possible and certainly in England and in Spain for a dog owner to really love their pet but to not want to train their pet all the time and for them to kind of expect the dog trainer to be a bit more like school and for them to come in and train the dog to do the average show things like walk and light nicely on a lead and come back when they're called without the more complex side of this whole like relationship management thing. I think the relationship management thing is one side of things and some trainers really, really emphasize that side of things, which is fine. Um, but I think it's almost like a different job really to evaluate the individuals and to to really work on those sides of the relationship between the dog and the owner and I feel like it almost needs a different title to dog trainer in some respects and I think some people are starting to call it different things because it's almost a slightly different job there's definitely aspects of that job in being a dog trainer but that isn't the job and I think that for a lot of the average show client they just want a well-behaved dog that they can walk to the beach and have a picnic without it jumping up at people or flying after chickens or whatever and they kind of want to be able to go tell me what I need to do on a short-term basis to get to that point and then I'm going to finish the dog's education and I want to live my life which I think is fine I think I think there's a little bit of both in it right I think that I I think it's unusual to come across a dog human pair where there isn't any relationship element whatsoever, right? Right. So I see I, I see it as somewhere kind of in the middle there. I often think of it as marriage counseling or relationship counseling, especially when there's a total breakdown. But no matter what, even for the lighter stuff, someone who comes to you, they do want that just the recall, nice leash manners. I do find that I have to get to know that individual person. That's why I say it's so much about human training for me. Like I'm not going to go in and teach them like. Pavlov and things like that. They don't care. They're not interested. I want to go in and find out what's the game that's going to motivate that human. Just the same mm -hmm. way I often teach my apprentices, like look at that human the same way. And I mean, this is a compliment that you would look at the animal, the dog, yeah. right? Look at them the same way because they are an animal. They have things that motivate them. They have things that will make them really enjoy this relationship with their dog so that they can continue the training that needs to be continued. I'm going to do everything I can while I'm there, but if it's going to fall apart when I leave, I need to give you a game that you want to play, right? And so thinking of it as games and thinking of it as fun and taking it out of the like, oh, you've got to be an academic to train your dog now. You have to memorize all this. You got to work at 15 minute intervals, 30 times a day. Like nobody wants to do that. Uh, I almost feel like I'm, I'm more of a coach than anything sometimes, if that makes sense. What do, what do games bring to dog training? I mean, as soon as you say games, my ears perk up. And so what are the advantages of playing games? Well, you got to think about what reinforces the human, and that's the fun, right? So them having fun, them seeing results with their dog. So some of the things that reinforce the human can't be controlled. Like, is their dog going to be successful immediately? And that's why um, if you can go in and you can show them success right away, great. But if you can't, you got to give them some other reinforcers. So do they like to play? Do they get competitive with other people? Uh, what is it that's going to bring that out? And so a lot of times games help us to take it into a different place where it's not adversarial with your dog. It's something fun and, and game of life. Team. Yeah, it's addicting even to like play with your dog. Anyone else about games? What do games bring to the training arena? Well, certainly when I think about play, I think play is probably the most underutilized skill by both trainers and to teach owners like we're very quick to teach owners when to give food and how to deliver food in a training environment. And I think we underutilize the 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 play element because I think that play as a as a as the various different types of game that fall under that umbrella of play are are probably the things that bond most dog and an owner. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, without a doubt, like the way I bond with my dogs is through play, playing with games, playing and, and, and playing with people as well. You know, that body to body contact, especially with the, the, a lot of the breeds that I 
that I do a lot of training with like mallies and, and bullies and those kind of dogs that really seek out that tactile contact playing and 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 appropriate wrestling and playing with your body against their body and stuff I think this stuff's really really underutilized across the board really yeah I think the play you have a normal person people are so stilted as soon as they get to dog class they won't talk they won't praise they won't say thank you they won't jump like a frog so games I think normalizes it no it's you and your buddy the dog just hang out chill do stuff and in the process you're changing behavior and you're teaching the dog communication and you're learning the dog's languages as well. But, you know, the, to me, when as soon as you say games, th this gives dog training so much, so much, and it does it in, in a lovely way, I think. So any, any more ideas? Well, for me, games, everything I train, everything I do is based on games, uh, whether it's finding drugs, narcotics, you know, weapons, explosives, Everything is based on the game. With your dog. I should emphasize with the dog. If that quote is taken out of context, I'm going to think, well, Julie's always looking for drugs and explosives. Yeah, I can Yeah, so it. for me, everything we do, believe it or not, is based on the game because you can't, you know, you can't take a leash and drag the dog to the bomb and say, here's the bomb, we're going to die if you don't sit on and show us where it is. You, you, you have to convince this dog to go hunt for it and go have fun. And it's all based on games. And Ian, you witnessed me train before police dogs where it's, we look for dogs that are crazy for toys. And the same thing with our police officers or special forces. One of the hardest things to teach is to praise the dog, to be that playful, animated person. And, you know, we always say, talk to them like they're a two-year-old child that just found an Easter egg. So, if, you know, if you, you got to go, hoo, 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 you know, we found this drug that is now very important for us but the dog doesn't know any different uh, and the same thing with pet dogs you know when we're training when whether we're training puppies around children children must be playing to create all that chaos children must be playing and doing their normal things that they do in real life they're not going to be sitting um like we want them to they're going to be banging a little truck on top of the coffee table and jumping off the couch and screaming and running so we recreate that we, we recreate those games. In fact, they have a game that's called the storm. And depending on the level of puppies and the age of puppies, we call it storm uh, level two, level one, level three. So if it's a category one storm, the children are a little <laughs> bit crazy, but a little bit calmer. When I and they, they know, these kids already know. So I pre-train the kids and I say, okay, kids, category two storm. And then kids go a little bit crazy. And if I say category three, you know, they go really loud and screaming and jumping. So uh, that's also games with kids, with children. And while they are playing games, we are training these puppies through games. Um, so I think games, everything is based on the game. You, you can only achieve so much through, um, what do you call it, com compulsive um, force training. You're not going to be able to ever um, succeed 100%, I think, through compuls compulsive and force training. Um, there are so many ways of training, but I think the most successful successful way is through games. And same thing with humans, right? We, we learn to do something that feels good. We will do this over and over again. And games feel good. We choose to play voluntarily. You know, if we if we come home, um, you know, in, in Russia, in, in Great Britain, you probably it's the same thing. All men usually go outside and play, you know, with a soccer ball. They play what we call football. Our football is soccer. Um, we you don't have to pay people to go play. You know, kids play for free. You don't have to, you know, bribe them to play. I think that's one of the most successful ways to train an animal and a human. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I think all of you here are, are mentioning people. And, and to me, you know, in a single sentence, dog training, it's all about people. And it's all about your attitude as a trainer, how you're going to engage with the owner. It's all about having fun with the owner and teaching them to have fun with their dog. So we're training the owner so they can train the dog. And that's where we have to realize, you know, the owner is not us. They don't have anywhere near your experience and expertise and so we have to change our mindset i think when we're teaching owners to now to use different methods that are easier simpler less time consuming you know the four e's we really have to concentrate on that because the old way was 
I'm a trainer, your dog's on leash, you will do what I tell you to do with your dog. It was that way for 70 years. Oh, and by the way, you can't get in class until your dog's a year old. There was nowhere to go, you know? So yeah, it's fascinating that the, I have two questions here. And when I ask the first one, I know I won't ask the second one because you will answer it before me. Like Kelly was the first to jump in, then Joe Rosie. Um, it's all about making training sparkle. You know, that, yeah, we could, we could make it really boring as it was, but now we're making training sparkle and we're really taking into account the people. So back to the original question again, define training. What do we actually do then very specifically? Eyes <laughs> go wide, deers in the headlights. Julie. Yes, I think, I mean, as, as we just talked about games, I think dog training in a way is role playing. It's playing, you know, hopefully everybody uses the same mentality. It, it should be fun and then it should be, you know, it should be playing. It should be playing with the dog, whether uh, role playing with the client um, or playing with the dog. It should be all based on um, repetitions through play. Let, let us ask, ask a question another way. Like, um, although I think, well, three of you compete, don't you, with your dogs. Um, and uh, as I know from reading your bios. Um, so when you're training a dog for competition, you're teaching it specific things. And so I, I, that's what I meant by training, the training process now back to just the dog. What are we trying to do with the dog? Kelly mentioned, oh, we're trying to open communication channels. Yeah, we're putting stuff on cue. The, the dog can't mind read, although they come very close by reading the nuances of our facial expressions and body cues, but how do we let the dog know what we want it to do? And so I look on, I, I guess, um, the training process as changing behavior, increasing or decreasing frequency of behaviors, putting them on cue, much more important, modifying the dog's temperament and personality, much more important, modifying the owner's behavior, motivating them. We could apply the same three eyes to the owner. And, and so um, let's uh, say how then, what, what are the, 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 the stumbling blocks we could have in this process? Let's see if we can pinpoint the things that will stop us doing all of this, making it fun, a game, an interaction, a communication process. Yeah. There is a long list of things, I think. Starting... What's the, the rank order, your long list, Julie. What's the number one thing? <laughs> I mean, I, for, for me, I mean, the dog, I, you cannot make chicken soup out of chicken poop, right? So Say that again. <laughs> you cannot make chicken soup out of chicken poop. <laughs> so oh, have yeah. a dog that is not social, that is fearful, afraid of its own shadow, and you are here to train this dog to, you know, learn 30 commands. I just, you know, I don't, there's, it's not magic. There's some dogs that you cannot go past certain point in training. So if the dog has not been properly socialized and properly um, environmentally exposed, you may not be able to achieve certain tasks. I, I also, the same thing applies to the owner. If the owner, you know, comes to you with expectations of you doing all the magic here and they have no interest in reinforcing it, you are only as successful as the owner is. So you can teach this dog 30 commands, they're gonna go home and the dog is going to do exactly what is natural for them. And it's not sitting quietly, politely when they see a squirrel or another dog or um, not pooping or peeing on the carpet because that, those things are natural. We don't have to teach them to do these things. If we taught them and the owner is not reinforcing it, then we kind of, our hands are tied because the dog will go back to what DNA, his DNA is telling him to do. So I think the start is to have, you know, to, to do successful, a successful type of training um, you have to have, you have to have some type of motivation in a dog. The dog has to have, you know, some kind of motivation, whether it's through, you know, food or toy or whatever. And the dog has to be handleable. You know, sometimes we have dogs coming from a shelter and it's a six-year-old dog that's never been touched. 
it wants to bite everything in sight and the person adopted it and it has, you know, the person has three kids in the family and they bring it to us and say, well, can you trade it not to bite my kids at six years old? It's never been around kids. It is absolutely impossible. So let, let, let's take that. Yeah, I mean, you're hitting at what I think is the most important point. It's, um, put it this way, you know, I, I want people to understand our frustration as trainers. And my biggest frustration is always the same. When I meet a dog, uh, my heart goes out to it. As soon as I start training it, you know, I love it. It's three-year-old shepherd, you know, or white whiskered dog or whatever. I always want to be able to turn the clock back, but I can't. And I think this is one of the biggest crimes in the whole world of dogs that uh, puppies don't get anywhere near the handling, neonatally, the environmental enrichment, the socialization that they should have got. And so most owners are behind before they start. So if I was saying, well, what holds training back? I would say the age of the dog. It's missed out on so much before we get it. So we as trainers are always playing catch up. I mean, how many people do you know will have a dog-dog reactivity program that say requires a month or two months? If you have the puppy, how long would it take? One so I, don't, I, I think that the responsibility there lies with the breeder. And I think that it lies not just with the socialization. So we've raised, we've hand reared and raised uh, two litters of Malinois in the last two months, uh, but we've also raised a bunch of other foster and rescue puppies over the last year or so. And we start socializing the puppies when their hand rears at around two and a half to three weeks. Um, and when they have a mother here, then around three and a half weeks. Um, and we socialize them in our arms because they can't go down because it's southern Spain and Parvo. But we'll socialize them up here for the whole time. We'll take them out and about. They'll go pretty much everywhere with us um, from that time. And depending on what the puppy's reaction is, depends on how quickly we can continue that that process and what I would say is that it's not just about that period and it's not just about the breeders doing the socialization it's about choosing the right bitch and dog in the first place because genetics do hold you back even when you're raising puppies um, when the, the puppies are are inherently frightened of the world or, or they're inherently wary of people um, the two Mali litters that we've just done this last two months are very, very different in terms of um, their genetics. One of them's very much a working line and the other is a, a more feral farm type line uh, and was rescued from a farmer that was drowning them. Um, and, and these two lines, even though they were the same breed, have been very different to socialise because the, the more feral farming type breed were inherently a lot more wary of people. And so we were unable to process as quickly because their recovery rates were much shorter. So we were, they were taking a lot longer to recover. So we were having to repeat the same level of kind of chaos around them in order for the puppies to recover and to begin to recover quicker and quicker and then be like, OK, this is fine and habituate to that situation. It took longer before we could then escalate that situation. So so it. I think the responsibility of all that lies with the breeder, but not just in terms of that socialization period, also in terms of which dogs they breed together to start with. Yeah, I, I think as trainers, you know, the, we are training, changing the behavior of the dog presented to us. We should stick with the principles, you know, that we can change that in terms of genes, we can't or it's difficult for us. Let's put it this way. I've tried for 50 years and failed to influence breeders and the point I always make is when two dogs are doing it out there well let's forget genes now because the gene team has just made its play and from now on the only things we can do are socialization and training but I think more of the owners what can they do they have no choice in which dogs are bred and they have really very little choice in choosing the right type of dog for them. I mean, we know they, they make ridiculous choices. I think as a trainer, no, okay, this family, two lawyers living together with 23 children, they wanted a Malinois. Okay, we have to train it for them. You know, we can't just say that was a stupid choice. It's a bit late for that. <laughs> and so, and when I think then, how do we affect or change the breeding practices in this country, which by the way, I think are horrific. Um, 
I think the only way is by educating owners. I think the only way breeders will change is by the supply and demand chain. Once yeah. owners understand, and I don't want to make this a downer, but how they're royally getting screwed by spending a lot of money and getting bullied into which one they should get. Oh, you can't have this male, you've got to have this female, and you, you can't chop his doodads off, or you have to chop his doodads, you know, all, all these rules. Um, the only way things can change is if they now start to vet the breeders as much as the breeders vet them. And what they really want is a dog that's going to live to be 10 or 15 or 17 or 20. They don't want a dog that's dead at five. So just that aspect of breeding. But I think owners can do this. When they see what they could have, when, look, I've seen all the videos of, uh, thus far. And for me, the video that really hit me in the face was the shortest video of all. And uh, uh, Julie just sent these little clips of dogs which have been socialized and dogs that haven't. It was chalk and cheese, light and day. These dogs could run up to people and sit and be hugged and greeted. The others you couldn't touch. And that's what owners need to see. And I think of all the videos of us training and doing the things that we do, and you know, um, that to me was the one that made the difference. Have you been socialized uh, and have you seen things to prepare you for life or not. Okay, but and can so we talk about socialization and what people think that is? And largely due to Sirius and how it has been interpreted throughout the world, people have this, not because of what Sirius was offering, yeah, but no. the way that it was interpreted and filtered through people's brains was that socialization is puppy to puppy play, that peer, <laughs> peer group play at, at any cost. And so, you know, people don't even know, um, yes, you know, people need to learn about how to find, um, be more you know, discriminating in, in, in the puppies that they choose. But, um, you know, plenty of people get adult dogs or adolescent dogs and they're trying to rescue dogs. That's, that's a whole nother thing. But I think it's important to talk about, you know, not only what training is um, for the average person, but what socialization really, really should look like and what that means. So that I think that's another term that the panel, if I may hijack this for a second, you can always tell me to shut up. Um, to, I would dream of that. <laughs> to, um, to define, you know, what is socialization? Not, not, not you. No, I, <laughs> I agree with you, Kelly. I think that um, it's very difficult for the average owner to even find really good information about socialization what it should be like most people know now when they come in I need to socialize my dog but they have this image of like a puppy cocktail hour and they're going to kind of sit with their coffee and watch their puppies roll about and I think a lot of even well-meaning dog daycare enterprises even some veterinary offices have said oh this is important let's open up a puppy social hour and then we have puppies sort of just like freewheeling for an hour without any moderation without even an expert in the room who can spot problem issues or help to educate the owners about how to handle them so I feel a tremendous responsibility as a trainer to create as many opportunities as possible for people to come in both with and without their dogs, get some socialization with professionals who can spot issues and then either relay them back to the owners or do it right there in the moment so that the owners can handle that sort of thing. Because even going a little bit back to Joe's point too, sometimes people have a very difficult to socialize puppy. And for us to say, oh, just give them treats every time you hear a noise or every time you see something weird isn't sufficient. And think about how like she's going out with a Malinois, she's a professional and she's going, oh, this is this is going to be a lot of work. And, and doing some of that nuanced stuff that we were just saying earlier, we don't want owners to have to even have to learn how to do. So yeah. all that to say, we need to help create some opportunities where we can influence this and, and help to make sure that those puppies who are more challenged get what they need in this socialization process. And then, of course, helping with the regular sort of easier to socialize puppies, too. And I want to go back to you when you said, you know, obviously we play and catch a game and you and I and all of the trainers know that, but the owners don't understand. And um, unfortunately, we don't show up in the picture until they already have the dog. And unfortunately, 
I mean, <laughs> if, they, if a very minimum they could do is research the breed, that would be great, but they don't even research the breed. They just buy, you know, an 80 year old couple buys a husky in a condo downtown somewhere and wonder why this thing goes in circles <laughs> or border colors. So not only they are not even researching the breed, which, you know, would be so helpful, but the problem is the heart gets in the way. And we have so many uh, customers and fam families. In fact, I just, we just trained a family a family's dog, it's, it belongs to a very, uh, um, you know, big, high profile customer um, who has access to just about any, you know, any breeder financially in the world. And they went and got a dog from the Amish fam family, which, you know, nothing against Amish people, but this particular dog grew up in a livestock environment, has never seen other people, has never been socialized. In fact, that puppy is in one of my video clips and I'm not going to mention which one, but, um, and I asked, what, what, why would you do this? Why wouldn't you just leave? And they, you know, I cannot tell you how many times it happens. The person says, I feel so bad. I felt like I rescued the dog and I just took it out of the bad environment. You know, that's when we, we hold our head and say, you just did the opposite. You encourage that breeder to keep producing because they just made money. And not only that, they can say, so-and-so, such a big pro high profile person just bought that puppy from me. So I, you know, I must make pretty good puppies. Um, how do we get to these people, you know, like you and I, I don't look up how to change an oil unless, you know, how to change a tire in my car unless my tire pops, you know, we, we don't really look up how to fix something. So I wonder, you know, how we can get to these people before they go out to a pet store or, you know, a puppy mill and get a dog just because they feel sad and, and, and they feel sorry for the puppy, including the puppy at the shelter. I love all these dogs, but you know, when you when when I ask interviewing a family, I ask people, what made you choose this puppy? This puppy is not a good choice for you know family with five kids and life you know lifestyle that's really loud and energetic. You know, this is a puppy that's very timid and terrified, and it's a little bit older puppy, so we're already behind a few months. And they always say, well, he was the only calmest puppy in the, in the shelter. He was the only quiet puppy in the corner that wasn't jumping on the, on the fence to greet me. So how do we get to these people before they get to the puppy? I, I think we did precisely with the short type of videos, what would you like, this or this? That short. The dog uh, taking a dump on the carpet, or a dog that goes out on site, sits by the door, and then eliminates on cue. A dog you can touch, a dog you can't. And um, But I think it's educating the owners. We can't just moan at the choices they make. And, and um, I, I would like to say a, a, a wonderful thing for owners. It's like, to me, we all know they, they pick the wrong genes in the dog. They pick the wrong breed. They, it's not socialized. It's, it's, it's all so wrong when you think about it. Yet you see them playing in the dog park. And by and large, because there's some dog park people like, oh, we don't go to dog parks, too dangerous. No, it's not. There's a bunch of owners there with a bunch of dogs and they're playing quite happily. You know, don't see too many dog trainers in this park, though, because they can't take their dogs there. You know, so by and large, owners take, which is to me is essentially a defective product, and they turn it into a dog that actually goes to the dog park once a day. I mean, it's like when you, you look, we, we all trained in there. It's, it's Amanda's training in Manhattan. It shocked me when I went to this dog park. I've never seen so many dogs, you know, all together, and there wasn't a scuffle. It, it, was a, it was wonderful. So I, I think owners do a pretty good job with what they get. I want them to make it better for them, to make it sparkle. And I think when they see this summit, they will realize there's two types of dog out there. One that has received this education communication since it came out, when it was neonate, before its eyes and ears open, and those that don't. And we're gradually pushing dog training backwards you know, Sirius started at three months and then Kelly, when she took over, pushed it back to, sorry, th th yeah, three months. She pushed it back two months and then Julie and, and Joe Rosie doing stuff, pushing it back to two and three weeks. And when they see the results of this and the type of dog it produces and what it does, they will become believers and that's what they want. You know, I, I think they will choose a, a, a very different way. But things, think, sorry. 
I think also, so when I used to run my puppy classes, I used to do um, four sessions outside of the class environment where we'd go. There was one public transport um, where we'd do lots of different public transports. There was one at a farm. There was one in town and then there was a coffee shop one. Um, and so as trainers, it's nice. And my staff at the time, it was always really nice to get the get it out of a classroom environment and begin to say. And the thing that I used to try and hammer home is what do you what do you want out of your dog in real life because really this is part of the socialization that I think is often missed which is that when you've got like when you've got a tiny baby little cocker spaniel then yeah it's lovely to watch it frolic around with the others and jump on it and play and do all that but when you've got an adult cocker spaniel yes it's still nice to look at watch it socialize with other dogs but you don't actually want it to give attention to other dogs when you're walking through the city or when you're sitting at a cafe it's going to become really annoying if every time another dog comes into a dog friendly cafe the dog gets up and runs around and I think like we we developed what we called an anti-socialization protocol actually which was um which was almost you know uh, which was teaching dogs not to socialize and we used to say you know there's there's times for the anti-socialization protocol where the rules are the opposite of what you think where you're actually training your dog not to socialize with the outside world not to go and see that person not to go and see that dog and this bit isn't about giving it you know the really good experiences of novelty because actually we've done that when the dog was younger and 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 we can continue doing that for the rest of the life but now we're beginning to educate the dog in our expectations and our expectations nine times out of ten are that I want to be able to run through the park on my daily jog with my dog without it going to say hello to everything and so I do think that as dog trainers and as dog owners, the, the, when it comes, if we spin it back to the definition of socialization, I think anti-socialization is as important as socialization <laughs> based on the merit of we're training the dogs. And, and especially for specific breeds, I, I think one of the worst things to happen was those studies that kind of defied the idea of breed and, and tried to like put out these headlines that breed doesn't matter. Because I actually think that breed, the same way that we look at food brands, supermarket brands, car brands, is one of the best ways to get to owners to show them so that they can have some idea of what they're getting when they choose a puppy. I think really we should be almost pushing, exacerbating the idea of different breeds for different jobs. And, you know, if you get this breed, it's going to be better than this breed. Because I think that's a good way to actually get into what they already pre-existing ideals and, and values and things like that. And, and I think anti-socialization especially is great for particular breeds, like your bully breeds with other dogs and things like that, where there are trends. To help them understand it like I love I love that term anti-socialization that's kind of fun like because I this is something that I've seen come up a lot in the city with what I was saying of having these sort of one hour socializations with no sort of structure to it um there's a there was a nice little bit that I found in one of the videos I that I was ju- that I just finished editing for the summit where I'm explaining to my clients why we're having their puppies settle and then play settle and then play like look to them and build attention and then play and I say something to the effect of, you know, otherwise your puppy's going to come into a room in their context of, hey, there are other dogs here is going to prompt them to turn into a tornado. And is that what you want when you're going to get a cup of coffee? And you can hear all the clients in the room go, oh, and, you know, like, so it really is very important just to educate the humans that, yeah, when you're at a coffee shop, you don't want your dog to be a tornado. When you're on a jog, you want them focused on you. So I love, I love the way you're doing that. That's cool. So this is, well, this is kind of what I was getting at. We, you know, we've been talking about socialization and the word socialization, obviously the base is social, which means, you know, interpersonal relationships. And so many people just associate that with the dog portion of, of their puppy's education. Whereas I think Ian, for, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think when you were first talking about socialization, yes, you wanted to puppies to bite and play and continue their litter like activities for, you know, for their development, but that was mainly about introducing them to lots of different types of people and lots of people doing different things. I would take it even further to, and I think we all do this, I'm not saying that we don't, but I don't think most people understand this, is um, it's more like acclimation. And again, Joe, did you say like to the, to the specific, their specific world that they are going to live in and maybe a little a little broader than their specific world because if you live with a shut-in you're still going to have to go to the vet a couple times a year and 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 such but you know it's it's what you know with open paw we always said you know what you know part of the the selection process for people that were coming to to adopt a, a dog so often not a puppy you know what are your 
the first question is, what are your, what is your lifestyle? What are your expectations? You have to envision your, your picture of what life with dog is to you and then dial back, you know, from, from there. And so socialization to other puppies and is great um, to some degree. You want your dog to be able to function like a normal, you know, citizen, um, uh, but they should not be necessarily magnetizing to dog in coffee shops in Manhattan, in the city center plazas. Um, and the anti-socialization is more, I, I know another way to look at that would be to call that, um, you know, like, um, uh, my handler focus. I mean, that's not really a very sexy term. We could come up with something better than that, right? But but you know, it, 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 turning it on, turning it off. But also, socialization is kind of just to ignore other things in the environment. You know, think of your average person. You know, um, barring any kind of you know phobias, major phobias. You know, you, you walk down the city streets and you don't make eye contact with every person who passes, and you don't you know, <laughs> jump on every someone's back and give them a nudge or something, or it's like, hi, 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 nice to meet you, nice to meet you. You know, you, you know <laughs> bye, or maybe unless you're coming, you're unless you're coming out of quarantine and everybody was very friendly. <laughs> <laughs> problems See, now. I think- I think that's the point. I think socialization is actually the foundation of anti-socialization. I think it is for humans too. We we socialize and we become habituated to each other so that we're not that important. Therefore, we can afford and we can we have the emotional stability and the resilience to be able to choose not to do things. When I come back to Ian's original question before, for me, it it, it always the, the biggest challenge I think that we come up against as dog trainers when we're training with owners is competing motivators. And I think if you have a good foundation of socialization and a good foundation of anti-socialization layered over top of that, then the, the biggest challenge of competing motivators that occurs is, is significantly lessened. I must jump in because it, uh, it like scoops it. the questions out of my head. The key word there is habituate. If you ask me to define socialization, it would be, I want to expose a very young puppy starting at two to three weeks to everything it could possibly meet in its adult life. So it has habituated to it and doesn't go back, oh, I nearly said a bad, back poop crazy, you know, whether it's other dogs or people. So we, why? We don't want the dog being upset. That's the whole point of it. The stress level is enormous in these adult dogs. And when they are that way, we can't train them. We don't want them overly them. excited yeah. or overly upset, right? And, and it's just, I just tell people we're trying to normalize, like we want to make um, novelty, um, norm, normalize novelty. Yeah. I think I think one of the biggest problems that as dog trainers that we sometimes, one of the biggest problems of dog trainers that we sometimes make or that, that I, I see often in the industry now is going the other way because I think what Ian said is bang on. It's about resilience, isn't it? And in order to create, resilience we have to first have stress so it's about creating these little stress inoculations where the animal learns to recover frequently and I think sometimes we can sometimes when I look at the way dog training and the way socialization or anti-socialization but particularly socialization is done is that we're actually we're trying not to create any stress at all and I don't think that's what you mean I don't think that's right I think we do want stress we do want little bits of stress where the animal's learning to recover frequently enough to to become resilient Yeah, I see this so much, especially as an urban dog trainer dealing with the kind of chaos that dogs are expected to handle in Manhattan. And there's a lot in the dog training world, especially when I was first starting out as a trainer, where I'd go to a conference and it's always about avoidance and then slow dosing, right? So it's like, oh, first remove the dog from everything and then slow dose them back in. And I used to hang out after every conference and ask the trainer who's speaking like, hey, what do you do when you can't avoid? Because where I come from, it's not possible. Like you literally can't. And I get some really cool little like piecemeal answers until I was able to come up with some different designs for training programs. But I, I think that it comes from a good place. Like we care so much about dogs that a lot of times as trainers, we see them feel that little bit of stress or we see that little bit of discomfort and we go, Oh, I must be doing something wrong, especially as new trainers. Right. So it's like, I must be doing something wrong. Let me like isolate and try to figure out how to fix this when sometimes it's, it's not as bad as you thought. And sometimes it is made, I like that word inoculation. It's that little bit, if I, as a professional can help moderate this in a way that exposes the dog, helps them to become okay with it, habituates them, creates resilience, then that's better, better for me to help a dog learn how to go to the dog run. Even when there is the occasional scuffle, you know, there's a scuffle, you come over to me. 
then for me to go, oh, dog runs are evil. I'm just never going to go, especially in the city where it's the only place your dog can be off leash. So but for me, fine. socialization is about rehearsing recovery. Yeah, nice. that's, that's a great, great thing. I think, and Julie, a lot of your program handles this with, um, with the working dogs, right? I mean, I think a lot of people could learn how to socialize better um, their companion dog, especially for something like Manhattan, if they watch someone like Julie's puppy program. I think. We, ra we raise not only service and therapy puppies, but the, um, so basically out of the litter that we raise and just scientifically <laughs> created this way of making these puppies stronger and stronger by day, um, turning them into Navy SEALs. So out of those puppies, we will actually, I created a puppy temperament test. Uh, it's a 20 step temperament test. And I can talk more a little bit about it in a private interview uh, to tell people um, how to do this. It should be available soon. We have our Ultimate Canine University in the works right now, online school, but it will be available for breeders and other dog, just puppy, Owner, future puppy owners, so they can kind of use some of these steps to evaluate the puppy's behavior in the litter and say, okay, this puppy is for me or not for me, or this puppy at the shelter is good for my family or not good. They'll be able to use some of these tools we use. But even with these puppies that we train daily to be little Navy SEALs, not every one of those puppies will pass with their service work. And so out of those puppies, we will dismiss some to families and families get amazing family companion pets because these puppies are socialized and environmentally neurologically stimulated through the roof. Um, and then they will just continue on. You can't just stop there. They continue on to um, go on. And we have a lot of clients um, like you, Amanda, they, um, they want puppies that are environmentally solid, stable to live in Manhattan. And those puppies, believe it or not, uh, uh, nearly have to be as close to a service temperament puppy as possible. You know, if we have a family that calls us and they say, no, I live in a regular, you know, subdivision. I'm not in Manhattan, but I have five kids. The <laughs> puppy we're going to choose for them is going to be a service quality puppy because mm -hmm. this puppy needs to be able to be okay with things that dogs are normally scared of, you know, screaming and banging and mom dropping a skillet. And then suddenly a little Johnny's crying because he fell on top of the puppy and, you know, the world is going crazy around them. Um, and so desensitizing them and socializing them, it, it's literally almost an art. And I think um, um, by maybe every, if every trainer had, had that available to owners online, YouTube videos and things like this, this is, what to look for in the puppy, which is what I'm working on right now, to have that video available. Here's a simple, few simple things you can do. When you go to a shelter, take the pup, take the dog into a room or into a play yard. I'm sure there's some kind of meet and greet area. Run through these simple steps. And if the dog reacts like this, like this, like that, that's good. If the dog reacts like this, like this, okay, maybe that's not the dog for your lifestyle. And the same thing with puppies. It's a 20 step temperament test. And depending on the reaction of the puppy, you're going to have five different reactions. You can combine the score at the end and say, okay, this puppy is great for my lifestyle, for my kids, for, you know, being in Manhattan or, you know, living uh, with a family with three kids, or maybe it's not the best match and I should probably move on. And I think maybe this is the way to reach people, uh, people, I guess, reach people and you know and show them if you show up to the breeder none of these puppies are doing these things you need to leave you should not buy a puppy from that breeder you need to go to the breeder that had put some work into these puppies from the day they were born i, I want to change topics now we're, we're running out of time i just looked at my watch um just to summarize what is the early enrichment socialization process are novel stimuli stressful? Yes, you get little cortisol spikes. However, within hours, days, you can build up a young puppy, a, a three-week-old, four-week-old puppy, to take an enormous amount of noise, action, clamor, as you'll see when, when you watch the summit. When you present these same stimuli to an adult dog that's had this level of enrichment, you barely get a little cortisol blip. But if the dog has not been exposed this way, it's adrenals empty. And that poor dog is shaking and in terror. To me, not to socialize is just downright cruel. Sadly though, a lot of people are scared of it. A lot of trainers, 
a, a lot of breeders, they think, oh, it's going to stress the puppy. No, we must expose the puppy to everything it's going to meet in real life, and then it won't react badly in real life. And so we can train it to do fun things, which I want to go back to, games. I, I, I want to, you know, the ways to make training sparkle. I, I think um, owners are the secret weapon to change things. Owners can change breeders. Owners can change trainers. So I think we should provide a class that's fun. And when we play games, it's amazingly motivating. I, I've never seen quicker learning in owners when you say, right, next week a prize, the dog that balances a biscuit longest on its nose. Imagine, and they come back and you've got dogs that do it for two to three minutes. <laughs> if I've said to them, right, homework tonight is sit stays. <laughs> well, how do you balance a biscuit on your nose? You running around and jumping on people? No, you're in a sit stay. So basically they come back with this great sit stay. So more benefits of games. To me, playing games offers everything that we want to give to owners so they can give it to their dog. So we've mentioned that it motivates them. You know, we've mentioned that it normalizes the people. They now smile and talk to their dog <laughs> and clap their hands. What else do playing games Well, it's relationship. Do? It builds relationship because Absolutely. ultimately dog training is relational. You know, and this is why one of you, one of you mentioned, you know, I, you know, I can teach, you know, all these, all these different, Amanda, I think it was you, maybe Julie, um, you know, I can teach all these things, Julie, it was you, um, but then if they go home and nobody reinforces anything or tries anything or practices at all, I mean, you don't have to drill, but you do have to interact and dogs aren't robots and it's not immediately, you know, uh, transferable. So relationship is huge and games enhance relationship and when you're on the same team as somebody you mm -hmm. you it's team building you know well and <laughs> i think the, your team member is your dog yeah. and the dog's on your team and you're doing something together yeah I think the other good thing about games great criteria and increases your relevance it's like so it's just say that I again I mean, it naturally raises criteria without having to describe what raising criteria is and so it's like we're going to play musical chairs now the distraction level during musical chairs is insane and the focus level of the humans on their dog is unbelievable and so i love that it just increases all of those d's we want to increase probably runs through your three eyes as well just to play a game <laughs> i think that also i think that naturally just because of what we what is the, the activities that are synonymous when we talk about games it increases movement and the movement of the human and the movement of the dog. And of course, this is gonna raise things like dopamine level and it's gonna get people more aroused and therefore more engaged and more committed to what they're doing. So just in and of itself, I think there's nothing worse than a still class. There's nothing worse than a training <laughs> session where someone has stood or sat in one place. The more that the dog and the human can move, the better it's always gonna be. Yeah, until, before, until they've heard your talk on dopamine, let's just say it raises smiles and tail wags and hugs. And yeah, it normalizes people, they, 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 they interact. But also the notion Amanda mentioned um, criteria, the owners know where they are. They know absolutely the level of control over their dog. They will strive to do better. Like the three of you that compete, when, when you drive to win in Mucker or wherever, you know, with your dog for three days in a hotel or camping outside, you know, to get in the ring for what, 20 minutes? What really makes you happy that day? Your dog did well, or you place. And the wonderful thing about a dorky game, whether it's musical chairs, as Amanda mentioned, whether it's uh, rocket recalls or recall races, you know, there's only one fastest dog. And people will strive and work for that. And once they know where they are, what is their dog standard? What was their personal best together? when they surpass it, they're gonna celebrate with the dog. And this is everything we're trying to teach them to do. Keep, keep records, you know, how, how good is your dog and then try and make it better. But when your you personal best, your Pardon? personal best. I love that, your personal best though. Yes, because personal best. I and I used to do that walking around the block when dogs pooped. Remember little Oso? 
when Oso would poop on cue perfectly backing up the hill, I would say, Oso, yes! It, the poop rolled perfectly between your four legs down the hill. You know, I'm sorry, but it would make me praise him for pooping, so I didn't have poop in the house. But you're right, your, your personal best together. This is what it, I think this whole why summit is all about. Sometimes we forget why people got dogs. We maybe get dogs because we're geeky and we like to practice, you know, but most people get dogs to have fun with their dog. They envision themselves frolicking on the beach or like laying around having a picnic. So let's like give that to them while they're also helping to improve their relationship and make that training stronger. And they also dream about sitting on the couch and hugging their dog, but they can't touch it. <laughs> That's why the early enrichment of socialization. It's like being married and you reach for your wife and don't touch me. You don't know how. <laughs> so, yeah. Human analogy games, are wonderful. I think games also provide, uh, when you were talking about criteria, I think the other thing that I love about games for owners is that it does provide a clear criteria. It provides a very clear way of being able to establish black and white, like kind of this is what is acceptable and this is this is a pass and this isn't a pass and I think that actually that's that's brilliant because I think there isn't there isn't enough of that in dog training often for dogs or for owners and it and it gives us a really clear way of being able to say, say to the owners like this exercise is enjoyable to you because you know exactly how to succeed you know that you have to do x y and z and that's going to get you to success now you've got to provide those sorts of games for your dog so that they also know how to succeed by achieving x y and z it has to be clear yeah we're gonna to have to say goodbye now i'd like to just comment zero it's absolutely right that um it used to be say competition was deathly it's like people had died and, and a good friend of mine gail burnham you know play training your dog the judge came up to her and said you smiled at your dog <laughs> yeah, I always smile at my dog. I mean, get lost. And and now training has really come a long way. And the in the last, I would say, 40 years, it, it really has improved. I think we can make it still better. But when I, I, I go back to all the videos that you've made, thank you. The words that are coming up in nearly every trainer's video now are engagement, focus, relationship communication, it wasn't that way 50 years ago. It was sit, jerk him. That was it. This is what the trainer would say to the owner and then the poor owner had to jerk their dog. You know, now we have many different techniques and not just I'm talking about the reward training positive stuff, but many different reward training techniques to choose from. You know, that and we, we can vary according to the exercise of the owner. Anyway, this has been wonderful. It's lovely listening to you all. I, I, every time I interrupt, I hate myself. I just want you all to know that, right? It's, it's always been a problem ever since I was a little boy. The number of times I got into trouble with my mouth. I just couldn't keep it closed. Um, you've been brilliant. Everyone's going to enjoy this summit. And I know... The reason I got the four of you together for the panel, I wanted you all to meet, and some of you don't know each other, and to chat. When you see each other's presentations, you're going to go, oh, wow. Yep, even dog trainers are going to be wowed by this summit. Owners are going to love it. And what I care most about is, um, for you doggy owners out there, whether you're trainers or not, your dog's going to be really happy that you listen to all these wonderful speakers. So thank you. You guys are my friends. I respect you very much. I think um, you made this panel fun. I could actually sit back and listen instead of monopolizing it, which I really try not to do, but Monopoly. there we go. So I want you all to wave and say goodbye to everyone for listening. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. And thank you for coming. Joe Rosie, Julie, Amanda, thank Kelly. Thank you so much. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.